What's up guys, Evil Deer here, and today I'm going to speak to you about a particular adjective I see jumping up in grammar discussions here and there, and it throws some people off if they're new to the language, and or it causes massive flame wars between two different people when they have a certain thought about something, and it's usually a way of saying, nah, -uh, I'm right. So the adjective is contral fundamenta, and it basically means against the foundation. Now, before I can just explain what that is, I have to give you a like a bird's eye view of the entire language, um, not the language, but the entire history of Esperanto from a grammar perspective or a like evolutionary perspective. I love doing this. <laughs> but anyway, okay, so here's how it all began. As we all know, Esperanto is an artificial language in origin. It's no longer artificial, it is like it's a fully living language which is just gr going along however it pleases, but in origin it's created. So you jump back almost like 150 years and you've got Zamenhof who created the language and when he created it, obviously only he spoke it and then more and more people started to learn it. Now by about 1905 you had a lot of friction within the Esperanto community. Even though it was small, a lot of people wanted to change aspects of the language and others wanted to keep them the same. And there was actually a lot of battles over this, just like today, okay? <laughs> Nothing's really changed, I guess, but yeah, so it was like that back then. And what the, the main um, pioneers of the language decided to do is they grabbed a bunch of documents that Zamenhof wrote and also some which I think he edited. But anyway, basically the main documents at the time like um, the Universal Dictionary, um, the Exercise, um, I think it was, uh, there was a few other things as well. And what they did is they clumped it all into one book and they called it La Fundamento de Esperanto. And basically what that means in English is the foundation of Esperanto. And this book was deemed ne touchable, which means not touchable. No one can, no one can change it. And if you attempt to change it and you start speaking your change version, you're no longer speaking Esperanto. You're speaking a different language. So the whole idea was that if you wanted to speak Esperanto, you had to follow the rules and principles established in the Fundamento de Esperanto. Now this was very important for the young language because it gave some form of stability to the language because no one wanted to really completely go against Zamenhof, like he's the guy who created the language. But anyway, it created a foundation and established norm and then everything else kind of just spawned off of that one um, grouping of works, okay? So it was the Fundamento de Esperanto. Now we're about 150 years later, okay? And nowadays, obviously, um, like for instance, I've never fully read the Fundamento de Esperanto through from beginning to end. I just I haven't. So, and most Esperantists, I, I'm going to say this, and I'm probably going to cop a lot of flack over this, but most Esperantists, I, I'd probably say 100% certainly, have never read it through either. Most of them have learnt what I call, or deem, modern Esperanto, okay? So modern Esperanto is obviously the Esperanto we all speak now, but it's quite, it's not quite, it's slightly different. Okay, it's slightly diverged from the original Esperanto. Now, when I say diverged, we can go back now and we can look at the Fundamento de Esperanto, at least the parts I've read, and still fully understand what's being discussed. However, if you grab someone from Zamenhof's time, you put them here, they wouldn't have a clue what half the stuff we're saying. Yes, because technology and everything's changed, but also because a lot of words have entered into the language which just didn't exist originally. They've just been added um, willy-nilly, I should say. Like, some people just, you know, found we need this word or we don't want to create this construction have just kind of chucked it all in and now we have modern Esperanto and also some grammar forms because of influences from other languages have changed even Volapük had made its original influence on Esperanto so it's had a lot of influences since the beginning and the language has slightly changed okay so what happens nowadays is you'll see a grammar discussion and say two Esperantists will get into a battle and they'll say one of them will say Tio estas contra fundamenta that is against the foundation or the founding document of Esperanto now what I'm trying to get at with all of this is is that even though it's against the founding document, it may not actually be against modern Esperanto because most people nowadays don't read, as I've said, the fundamental de Esperanto. What they do read is um, La Plena Illustrita uh, Votaro, which is uh, PIV. It translates as um, the fully illustrated dictionary, though it's not illustrated anymore, at least not the online one, which can be found at votaro.net. Um, and that there is like the main dictionary in the Esperanto community. It's fully in Esperanto. So obviously there's main dictionaries for 
different the different languages but for the Esperanto dictionary that's the prominent dictionary that exists and most people refer to that and how it specifies the usage of words now what you got to remember is la plena illustrita votado also refers back to the fundamental in most of its definitions it will say this is how it was used in the founding document and this is how it was used and although some of the uses have expanded and changed slightly ever since then now the next thing is a lot of people obviously use the style guide which is P Meg in English and that translates as um Plena man libro de Esperanto Gramatico. Now, basically, whenever someone has a grammar question, most people refer to that document and say, no, it's this is how it's used. Now, La Plena Man Libro de Esperanto Gramatico, it has also, um, it also, sorry, refers back to the fundamental de Esperanto, but again, there are certain usages and styles it recommends, which is also technically, I will say, contra el fundamenta, although not everyone will debate that, and some people will debate that. However, there's also another source of the language overall, and that is the Academia de Esperanto. Now, the Academia de Esperanto has been around since almost like slightly after the time of the Fundamental de Esperanto, and its main goal was to basically shepherd the evolution of the language. And when I say shepherd, you gotta remember, as a language grows, no one controls it, not even the creator. That's what happened with Volapük, that's why it failed. That's a, that's a discussion for another video. But basically, as a language evolves, no one has control. But the Academia de Esperanto um, is basically uh, a grouping of, I can't remember, like 20 individuals who are usually really highly regarded in the Esperanto community because of um, books they've written or because of all sorts of stuff or because they actually worked on these other documents I've previously mentioned. And their job is to say, this is how you should use something, this is how it's recommended, and that recommendation is based on usage in the Fundamental de Esperanto. Now the problem with the Academy is that there's certain things they can just never authorize, even though it's used in everyday conversation because it's just contra el fundamenta, and they don't want to like, you know, stick their necks out and say, yeah, well, even though everyone uses it this way, it's not really like that in, you know, the Fundamental de Esperanto, because someone will come along and hack that head off. Not like physically hack it off, but you, you get the idea. So yeah, the th Three main sources are the Votado, or sorry, La Plena Illustrita Votado, um, La Plena Man Libro de Esperanto Gramatico, and La Academia de Esperanto, okay? So those are the three sources, but mo they all, in varying degrees, also refer back to the Fundamental de Esperan Esperanto. And then, you also have the Modern Esperanto, which is reflected in those three, however, is different again from those well, not really the first two, but it's different slightly from La Academia de Esperanto. So, you've got the language, which is being um, recorded by those three, and the language has changed slightly since the beginning. So, whenever you hear Contra el Fundamenta, it's basically saying, you're, what you're saying is against the founding document. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad Esperanto. Now, that's usually thrown out when people start talking about proposals for language reform and change. Now, that's another topic, but I'll just quickly talk about it again. Proposals are usually done when someone sees, or a group of people see, a particular imperfection with Esperanto. What you have to remember is that Esperanto is a living language. It, Oh, yes, it's probably it's probably got heaps of imperfections, but you can't change that. It's a language. It's like going up to someone in English saying, sorry, I don't like the way that you're using this. Can you please change it? Because no one's going to take you seriously. The problem with Esperanto is that since it's got artificial origins, people think it's still artificially controlled. No one controls this language. Good luck with that. Um, oh, and by the way, a more recent development in the Esperanto community is uh, Wikipedia, which is Wikipedia. That has also got a very big influence on the modern usage of Esperanto, because obviously Wikipedia is probably the most up-to-date out of all of those, because there's a lot of topics which aren't discussed in any of them, but are in Wikipedia. So, if you can't find whatever you're looking for in those, you go look at Wikipedia, but you gotta remember, if it's a new concept, there's probably a lot of discussion and debate about how to speak about this concept or what verbs to use, etc, etc. But yeah, that's, that's the main sources of the language itself. So, if you've understood all that, you'll now understand and uh, understand why it's impossible to reform Esperanto, because it's a language and no one actually controls it. You can put out a proposal if you like. For instance, I've seen a lot of debates recently about um, ichismo, which is a um, debate about uh, sexism in Esperanto. And I'm not gonna, uh, not in this video, I'm not gonna say which one or whatever way we should go, but 
For those who do propose it, the only thing I can say is that if you really propose it, use it. Most, like, uh, you know, most Esperantists will either understand you or they won't. And you'll either break the communication or you'll help communication, whatever. But you've got to use it, otherwise no one's going to understand it. And if you're going to go, oh, but everyone's going to complain, well, then give up on the proposal because it's never going to happen. It's a language. It's... In all honesty, most proposals for any language never actually happen. When you think about it, languages evolve based on needs. Like for instance, this is one that I like to talk about for a lot of people. And I know I'm starting to go a little bit off topic here, but I want to get this out. There's a word for cool in Esperanto, and that is mojosa, okay? And most most of the older generation of Esperanto, not most, but a lot of them don't like it, okay? They'll be like, that's that's not a real word, whatever, like they'll say it's Contador Fundamenta, which it's not really, but they'll say, you know, it's got no backing anything or this or that, but it's a word that's been internally created in Esperanto through organic means, there's no way of really controlling that. And the reason it exists is because there was a need for it. And the thing is, as more and more young people used it, the older people obviously learnt its meaning, and even though someone might say that's Contador Fundamenta, guess what? Everyone understands it now, and that's how it is. So that's how languages evolve in general, and that's exactly how Esperanto evolves. And that's why most proposals will never see the light of day in any real usage. When you think about it, most proposals are actually put forward by people who have just started learning the language, and once they've fully learned the language, they give up on those proposals. And if those proposals have got any merit, they will find their own way naturally into the language. Now I've got way off the topic, like I was just meant to be talking about one thing and I've just gone all the way off, you know, you, that happens. Anyway, so if you've liked this video, give it a like, share it around with your friends, especially those who are just learning Esperanto and obviously if they speak English, um, and subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video. And if you're not there, well guess what, I'm gonna hit you with the fundamental de Esperanto. <laughs>